Well, hello, Crosswinds. Welcome back to the Crosswinds Church More Than Sunday podcast. And uh, I'm Chris Coley. I'm the senior pastor here. And uh, it is Thursday, the Thursday before Good Friday, uh, leading into Easter Sunday. And we have a very special podcast for you today. I, I've got Dr. Steve Girali with me again today. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about what Passover looked like for Jesus and the disciples on the Thursday before the crucifixion. Enjoy this. How you doing, man? Doing good. Yeah? I'm getting in there, huh? Yep, we're hanging in. We, we are in our Holy Week uh, uh, podcast series that we're kind of doing here on this. And um, uh, each week, I'm sorry, every day of this week, we've been doing a different uh, podcast that's really centering around the Holy Week and, and um, just different things. So the first day, Jody and I kind of talked about what our Good Friday experiences at a church would be this year. Um, mm-hmm. Tuesday, uh, Andrea and I kind of went through Psalm 22, which is what I, I preached on last Sunday. And uh, Tuesday, I got to go further into depth on the podcast. Wednesday, um, we heard from Dave Nielsen, who was the guy that helped build our campus. And he talked about the story behind the cross that we put out front, which is an old set of rusty I-beams we found in the creek and wow. turned into a giant cross. And this is significant because it's Thursday that we're releasing this one. It's the Thursday before Good Friday. And uh, you and I had talked about possibly spending today's podcast talking a little bit about the Last Supper, which, correct me if I'm wrong, would have happened on Thursday, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. So th- this was something you thought might be a good idea to talk about. And, and um, I'd love for you to just kind of walk us through it a little bit. What, 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 what would be important for us to know that maybe sometimes we miss? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I find this story in Holy Week probably the most powerful story. It's, um, it's really the moment at which the disciples have their decisive aha moment. Um, let's kind of get a running start into this, you know, yeah. for, for three years prior to, um, to, to, uh, walking with Jesus. They, I mean, they're, they're, they've spent three years with him and they've been talking with him and he's been teaching them and they've got all this foreshadowing of Messiah and he calls himself the Messiah and they see the miraculous part of Messiah and um, and yet they still don't get it, and um, and so it's uh, during this week, this last week in Jesus's life, Jesus has some intimate conversations with the disciples. He talks about who he is. He asks them who uh, who they think he is. You know, right. yeah. And um, and they and and he foreshadows his death. But then they come into this this time on Thursday where Jesus has an upper room experience with them and they're preparing for Passover. Um, Passover is important. They know what it's all about. It's celebrated every year of their life since they were born. And yeah. Jesus takes this moment and he puts a different kind of spin on it because he talks about the fact that um, that he takes the bread and he breaks it and he hands it to them and he says something about this being the new covenant. Now that's really important because throughout the the life of Israel, God has uh, revealed himself and revealed his plan through covenants. And yeah. one of the covenants that was made, it was made in uh, through Jeremiah. Jeremiah talks about uh, the coming of Messiah and that Messiah would redeem Israel. And that covenant is called the new covenant. Hmm. So when Jesus breaks the bread and he hands it to them and he says, this is the new covenant, all of a sudden the lights go on. And yeah. we, see, we see this dramatic shift in in the disciples because now it makes sense what what had happened prior to this that was leading up to it um didn't quite make sense they didn't know why he was dying they didn't anticipate that they thought he was going to be the redeemer 
in some way, shape, or form, politically or um, or militarily. But now he's talking about the fact that he's the suffering servant that's going to die and redeem Israel, and they get it. Steve, when when you talk about the new covenant being referenced in Jeremiah, mm-hmm. what's the context of that? I mean, what is it? What is it meaning? Uh, to people who are listening to it from Jeremiah. Well, you see, Israel Israel was, when Jeremiah prophesies, Israel is going into exile. And so so it's a hopeless time. And they were, they were anticipating that they, w- they were going to be redeemed by God. And so God made it really clear that the Messiah would come, the one who would rescue them, the one who would save them and redeem them and restore them would come. And, um, and so that's the prophecy that's made through Jeremiah. And it's one of the only um, prophe- uh, prophecies of hope in mm. all of the book of Jeremiah. Yeah. That Messiah would be the redeemer. And, and, and it's a covenant that God says, I will do this for you. I will redeem you. I will yeah. send this Messiah. And, um, and so they, so they knew that they knew that growing up, they, yeah. it was part of their history. It was a part of their, their theology. It was a part of their, um, their heritage. So yeah. they knew this new covenant. And, and so they're all waiting for this new covenant and for generations, they've been waiting for this new covenant. Here comes Jesus. He, he's, he's saying all these things, which are somewhat disheartening, right? Like I'm going to die and any number of any number of things that they don't seem to get or want to embrace. And then all of a sudden here at the Last Supper, he takes the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And it's like the light goes on, as you put it. It yeah, clicks for them. But, but we have to remember, too, that before he started talking about all this dying stuff, he proves himself to be Messiah because they knew that Messiah would make the lame walk, make the blind see that, you know, all of those things. And, and they're just looking at it as, is he a prophet? Is he, you know, is he this man of God? They, they, they call him rabbi. They don't reverence that reverence him as Messiah. And so, um, so up until this point, they see all this stuff. Then he starts talking about dying and they don't make the connection with the entire prophecies that mm. that Messiah would come and and he would he would um, liberate uh, and then he would die. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And so so when when Jesus says, "I wouldn't you have loved to have been in the room and just yeah. see this aha aha moment when yeah. all of a sudden they go, oh my gosh." Now right. it makes sense. The new covenant. This is the new covenant. Yeah, yeah. You know, and um, and so I think that was that was a powerful, powerful moment in in the life of uh, uh, of the of the disciples, and a turning point for many of them. Let me ask you this. You know, sometimes I think this gets lost on us people who have uh, are coming. You know, almost two thousand years after this Last Supper moment. Um, what did it mean for someone back then who had been living under an old covenant to hear that they were now <laughs> ushering in a new one? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't, I, I would love to know the answer to that, but I just, I just think that what happens here is, uh, remember, we don't have any record of Jesus ever doing Passover like it was supposed to be done. Yeah. And so so there is breaking of bread during Passover and uh and I would imagine that Jesus all of a sudden is putting a new spin on this thing and just going in a direction that that kind of catches them off guard. And so being yeah. caught off guard is the way that they're being set up to really understand this. Yeah. Have you ever done a a, a Seder dinner or a Seder meal a Passover dinner? Yeah, I have. We've 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 hosted them a few times at Crosswinds over the years, and mm-hmm. and there's certainly a lot of ritual to it, right? You've got uh, a, any number of like things that you taste that all taste terrible, by the way. Yeah, it does, <laughs> and it's supposed to. 
we're both Italian from Chicago. You know, <laughs> when you tell me we're going to have a, a, a special meal, I get excited. It better I have pasta. Pasta. <laughs> Masticcioli. There's yeah. going to be meatballs involved. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And then I show up at a Seder dinner and it's like horseradish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is it? Bitter, bitter even, herbs. Uh-huh. Bitter herbs. It's it's pretty terrible. And, and uh and so imagine for a second being the disciples and you've been celebrating that as your Passover dinner every year of your life. Right. Yeah. And you you show up at the last supper. And I, I don't know, for, for all we know, maybe they did that, too. But it ends with Jesus taking. In fact, uh, I, I would assume <laughs> they did do the other things because this wouldn't be enough of a supper. Um, right. uh, but but. He takes the other things, he takes the bread and he breaks it. And, and all of a sudden now they're getting like good bread. Yeah. And, and then he takes wine and all of a sudden now they're getting good wine. I mean, this had to be so different for them when all of a sudden the ritual changed. Yeah. And, and the ritual, the ritual in and of itself, that, that Seder dinner, the remembrance of Passover is a somber thing. You know, yeah. so they're they're already they're already preconditioned for that, and then yeah. add add to that that Jesus is talking about his death, yeah, and he's giving them this this final this farewell speech. We know that because John records that in yeah. John fourteen and fifteen that upper room discourse, and um and so it's really somber, and and then so you've got this mood this heavy mood. That's that's playing out, and he breaks the bread. And you're right; they're hungry, and so they see this. But then he comes in with this double whammy of new covenant that is complete joy. Yeah, that this is the new covenant. Yeah, you know, and um, mm-hmm. and it, it had to be. It had to just be a a powerful, powerful moment. Yeah. No doubt about it. That's cool, man. Um, all right. Now, I, uh, do you mind if I, I switch subjects for a second to another no. moment that happens at the, at the, at the Last Supper? Yeah. Um, it, it's right after that that Jesus says, one of you around this table will betray me. And I did not tell you I was going to ask you about this. I didn't think yeah. of asking you about it until just now. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's my usual way, Steve. That's I'm going to okay. just kind of surprise you with a tough question i'll just have to make up an answer (laughs) he says uh (laughs) somebody around the table is going to betray me right Mm -hmm. and um i don't have it in front of me but i if i recall correctly that the disciples are all like it's not going to be me who's going to be the one who does this and then judas sneaks off (laughs) and goes and and basically turns jesus in for for 30 pieces of silver is that right right getting Mm -hmm. the number yeah And, and is I think of that, how did they not notice that Judas was sneaking off in that moment? One of them leaves right after he says this. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that that's a misunderstanding. I think okay. that they, they come to the realization when Jesus says, he says, this is the person who betrays, because they're all asking, is it me? Is it going to be me? You know, and he says, yeah. the one who dips, who's dipping his... Uh, it, it, you know, sharing the oil with him right now is the one who's going to betray him. And, yeah. and I think all attention goes to Judas. And what mm-hmm. happens is Jesus in, in one of the gospels invites him to leave and says, whatever you're going to do, go do. And so I think what happens is they, they understand who this is. They know he it's going to be Judas. He walks, yeah. He gets up and he walks out. Yeah. You know, the question is, is, is more along the lines of what would Judas be thinking if all of a sudden he's exposed, Right. you know, yes. you gotta, you're going to, you're going to go run and do what you, what you'd plot it, you know, do it anyway. Yeah. So, well, of course, and, and, and it's right after that, that Jesus then turns around and, and predicts Peter uh, denying him as well. So I guess there's. There's there's room for all of the the blame to spread. <laughs> it's right, there. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, what do you what do you think that this new covenant thing means for us today as people who are reading it? Besides just the light turning on for for the disciples in this moment, I mean, um, what can we take from this and, and apply to our world? Yeah, the the great part about this is the prophecy isn't finished. 
because mm-hmm. uh, a lot of what we read then uh, about the, the reign of Messiah is that he's going to come again. Yeah. And, and while, while that was shadowy for, um, for Israel because they, he hadn't come in the first place, uh, they couldn't separate which coming was which. And, um, and so for us, we do have, we do get to live in that. Yeah. And, um, and so that's why, that's why then Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. It's not just remember me because I'm dead, but remember me because I'm Messiah. Yeah. Remember me because I'm coming. Remember me because I'm Redeemer. And so I think we get a chance now to live into the anticipation of that as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, and our, our, our risen Savior is coming back. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's good, Steve. That's good, man. Thank you so much. It's so good to hear from you and have you explain something like that, especially on a day where we can actually be remembering that and um, yeah. celebrating it. So we appreciate it. Uh, I'm well, sure I'll call you again next week with more. Uh, okay. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Steve. Take care. Okay. Bye.